Uh, welcome back. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to have people in the ether out there joining us as well. Uh, we're never going to know from day to day who was here and who's there, but we're one large community. Uh, we'll get started in a minute or two talking about Troilus and Cressida, but before we do, I just want to make sure that whether there are any questions about the mechanics of the course. The syllabus is downloadable from the website if you haven't brought one with you, if you don't have one in hand. It's very straightforward. It's a play a week. Uh, the, you'll remember that we ask you to email in questions, to come prepared with questions. I will normally, and, and, be, and because I've asked you, hello, uh, because I've asked you to read my chapter in Shakespeare After All. Has anybody had any difficulty finding a copy of Shakespeare After All? It's, uh, I've asked you to read my chapter on that topic, on the play, as well as the play itself. I don't want to recapitulate that material straightforwardly, so I will often ask uh, to begin with a couple of questions that we can put on the board as a, as a kind of starting point where you want us to start rather than where I might decide that we want to start. And that will not keep you from asking questions, I hope, throughout the entire two hours traffic of our time together. Uh, but in particular, I'm hoping that you will play the, the lion's part in the second half of this discussion. Uh, Mel and Larry have, are armed now with their, their trusty portable microphones. Uh, remember that if you ask questions or make comments, which you're also absolutely free to do, uh, that wait, if you will, for the microphone to come to you so that the people who are taking the course distance can also hear what you're asking or what you're, you're intervening with. This is not a lecture. This is a conversation. And you should feel absolutely free at any moment to interrupt, to take the stage, to ask a question, to say that I'm not being clear, to say that you disagree with me, uh, or to say that you find the play difficult or unwelcoming. Uh, for how many of you was this, hi, uh, your first encounter with reading Troilus and Cressida? Uh, and for those of you, did you find it uh, a, a comfortable, wonderful, rewarding experience, a difficult experience, a mix? Can I have some reading responses? Yes. Just wait, wait, wait for the, right, sorry. I, I thought it was a mix. And I guess reading it, uh, reading about uh, my question really was that the heroes really don't seem like heroes. Yep, that's quite right. Yeah. I think that that will be often the case in Shakespeare. I'm going to talk a little bit about why that seems most particularly yeah. true in this case. But I think even uh, a, uh, more straightforwardly idealized figure like, hmm, who? Who would be a Shakespearean hero that we would expect to be heroic? Henry V. Mm -hmm. Henry V. Henry V. Indeed, but we, you know, it takes him three plays to get to the point where he looks heroic, and he only looks heroic against the background of everybody saying he was a wastrel, he was a playboy, he hung out with the wrong people, and so forth. So that this question of full heroism, but nonetheless, heroism is in a way the topic of the play. The possibility of heroism is in a way the topic of the play. And so it is not surprising to find that in some ways no one lives up to that ideal or that if people do live up to that ideal, it is at great risk to themselves, as in the case of Hector, who plays by all the rules, who offers single fight, who is willing to be a champion, who fights on behalf of a principle rather than according to his own beliefs, who do does thinks that Helen should be given back, but nonetheless will fight for her, who will not fight Ajax straightforwardly because Ajax is his cousin, and who, because he plays by every single one of the rules, is in fact ganged up on the result of a, uh, dies as a result of an ignoble, ignoble non-straightforward non fight and is then dragged around uh, on Achilles' chariot throughout the city. That's what happens to heroism in this play. But we'll, we'll, I, I, I hope that we'll talk a good deal about why that might be so and what that tells us, if it tells us anything, both in our own time and in other times. Other comments about the experience of encountering the play? Um, I found the, the language, especially the long speeches, uh, really dense with poetic imagery. Right. Almost like that was the point of the speech mm -hmm. more than moving the action. Well, that's a very, very helpful thing to say. 
I think both halves of what you say are true. The language is extremely dense, metaphorical, stuffed language. The language of Shakespeare entering you know, a major phase of his writing, though in fact the ends of the, at, at, when we get to the end of the semester, we'll find that these very great plays at the end are emptied out of this kind of metaphor, that the metaphor comes to life on the stage rather than being in the lines. But it's very true that there are a lot of moments, and I want to talk about those too, in which everybody kind of stands up and makes speeches. And they make speeches against one another, and they make speeches on behalf of themselves. And uh, things do come to a, not exactly a halt, but rhetoric takes over. And it's not necessarily the rhetoric of persuasion. It's the rhetoric of iteration. It's the rhetoric of staking, staking a claim or taking a position that, in fact, you already are expected to be taking. Nobody is surprised when Nestor says what he says, when Agamemnon says what he says, when Ulysses, nobody says, oh my, do you really believe, I mean, Troilus of course says, you know, we must defend Helen. And they, 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 uh, they act out their own rhetorical positions at very great length. Uh, the passages are gorgeous and well worth analyzing, and we will analyze some of them. But it's very true that there would be a sense that this very martial play, which ends with a lot of fights and a lot of deaths and so forth, is it at some points very static indeed, and that it takes that form of kind of talking heads, of you know here are the Greek generals and here's what they have to say, here are the Greek generals and here's how they're going to kiss Cressida, here are the potential uh, Trojan heroes for Cressida to choose her favorite one while talking to Pandarus. A lot of lines of people performing or not performing, so that the the, the language does have have a very full-bodied quality. And I choose this phrase from the language of line, wine advisedly because, in fact, as you all have noticed and all the criticism about this play says, it's full of language of food and drink, of digestion, of scraps of food, of leftovers, of waste, and so forth. It's about consumption. It's about consuming yourself. It's about uh, being overstuffed in some way. And there is a sense in which uh, the characters and the lines are overstuffed. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful play. It's a very highly admired play. It is not a play that everybody reads in high school or in college. And, so, and because of this quality that you're describing, also because of the quality that you mentioned about this, the, the, the rather anti-heroic elements of the play, which are indeed a lot of what it's about or a lot of what it's worrying about, uh, it's often a play that people encounter with some uh, nervousness or some, some, some discomfort, some uncertainty as to where they should place themselves with regard to this play. So I want to begin by placing it in a couple of ongoing cultural and, and, and historical and performative conversations uh, and suggesting some analogies for the play, both within the Shakespearean corpus and outside it, so that you will feel that you own this play more than you may feel right now. Because this play should be part of your personal pantheon in just the same way that Hamlet is, or Othello is, or King Lear is. And part of our purpose in beginning with Troilus and Cressida and then with Measure for Measure before we get to the plays that you will expect in Shakespeare's high period, like Othello and Macbeth, is to show you why these are all part of the same set of rhetorical and, and characterological and, and ideological concerns. The first thing I want to say is that even though I spent a lot of time last time talking about King James, I want to make sure that you understand that this is an Elizabethan play. It's a play that was probably written in 1601, uh, and that it, uh, it is written, that is to say, around the same time as Hamlet, which is 1600-1601. Uh, if you know Hamlet, you'll know that there's a famous moment in that play in which the, the traveling players come to Elsinore, and Hamlet welcomes them gladly, and he says to the first player, the major actor, he says, please recite me a speech from Aeneas' tale to Dido. Please recite me a speech from that wonderful old play that I admire so much that I've seen you perform elsewhere. And in fact, the first player does by memory, and Hamlet clearly has remembered this speech as well, recite at great length from this very moving speech, uh, moving play in, in couplets and in, in, in blank verse uh, about uh, the, 
Aeneas the Trojan, having escaped the ruins of Troy, meeting with Dido in Carthage and telling her about the fall of Troy and telling her the story of the death of old King Priam and how it is that people in Troy responded to that death. Now, obviously, from the point of view of Hamlet's own play, the death of a king and the suitable mourning of his loving wife is very much thematic to the play of Hamlet. But the, what, what's also crucial here is that this, so that the, the, the play, in a way, suggests that the ancient world had it right, that men were men, kings were kings, old men were mourned, and their wives really mourned for them and tore their hair out and so forth, as opposed to this modern world, the world in, of Hamlet, in which uh, the wife not only doesn't seem to mourn, she remarries very quickly and remarries somebody who turns out perhaps to be the murderer of her first husband. Uh, so within Hamlet, that's one of the functions of that, that play. But it also suggests to us something about the preoccupation of this period with this model, with, the, with the, the fall of Troy, with the notion of heroic greatness, with, again, people behaving as they ought to have behaved. Because here's, here would be a case in which heroism presumably is truly functioning in which the, 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 uh, the, they die as heroes, the wife mourns, the old man is, is, is not a laughable figure like the way Ulysses mocks Nestor, but is in fact a grand figure and so forth. Here is how the ancient world ought to be and how the fall of Troy ought to be understood. So this is, this is in the language of Elizabethan culture. This is in the mind of the playwright Shakespeare at the time when he's also then setting out to write his own play about the fall of Troy, which doesn't look anything like that heroic moment uh, in the stuck in the middle of Hamlet. Now again, stuck in the middle of Hamlet, it, it, it contrasts, those of you who will remember Hamlet will remember, with the modern play, The Murder of Gonzago, The Mousetrap, about the perfidious wife, who, or the weak wife, who says she's never going to marry again if, her, if she loses her first husband, but who does immediately and so forth, where the modern world looks much more like the world of Hamlet's own time. And it's contrasted with the ancient world. Uh, in in Troilus and Cressida, we, whoever we are, are in the middle of this ancient world, and lo and behold, it doesn't look very, very classic. It looks, in fact, deeply, deeply modern in its uh, conflicts about fidelity, about uh, the, the, the honor due to the old, about, about heroic codes, about uh, what's worth fighting for, that, that all of these things that are hypothetically presumed in some notion of classical literature as the model of heroism are here up for grabs. So here is Shakespeare, our playwright, working with this material and working with it in the same time period in very interesting ways, sometimes as the back shadow as it is in Hamlet and sometimes as the foreground as it is in Troilus and Cressida. Uh, now, the, Queen Elizabeth herself is within a couple of years of her death. She is an old woman. She is a very powerful monarch. Uh, she has been receiving uh, love embassies for decades from people who would like to marry her, uh, long beyond her childbearing years, because marriage to the Queen of England is a way to become the King of England and to take over power and so forth. So she, for a long time, has, has, has been this beloved love object, uh, regardless of what her actual age is or her actual eligibility is for love, marriage, sexuality, romance, whatever it is. Uh, it is not a huge, huge stretch to think that some of the ambivalences about what it's worth fighting for when it comes to Helen might be in your mind as you're thinking about Queen Elizabeth, that, that, that the, uh, the, the issue of a world which is configured around a woman and her behavior is now somewhere in the air. Uh, in the politics of the time, one thing that has happened to Elizabeth is that people who adored her have begun now to think of themselves as her successors rather than her suitors or her rivals. And this was particularly the case with her, her former favorite, the Earl of Essex, uh, who in 1601 uh, fostered a, uh, or attempted to foster a rebellion on the part of the populace uh, to make him the king. Uh, to, to depose her, to suggest that he might, might in fact, replace her. 
this is quelled, he is, is disposed of, uh, but the, the, the notion of Essex here as a kind of Achilles is one thing that people have observed about this play, that there's a kind of reflection here uh, in the, 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 the politics within the play of the politics that are surrounding the play. Uh, in any case, what is clearly true, uh, whatever we think about these historical echoes, uh, is that the English associated themselves very much with the land of Troy. That one of the old names for London is Troy Nouvant, Troy Novant, New Troy. Uh, that the idea, this is, this is what's, what's called in classical learning translatio studii and translatio empirii. That is to say, the, the travels of learning and the travels of empire from their supposed source in ancient Greece and then ancient Rome, across Europe to England, and then ultimately to the American century, the past century, the idea that these things travel westward, that empire travels westward, that learning travels westward, uh, and that the literary canon as we understand it, for example, might begin with the ancient Greek classics and might end with, with, uh, what, with uh, American literature or with, in fact, uh, literature written to the west of America, but the, the, the idea was that learning traveled and that, that it was, you know, trans, translatio means to, to, to travel and also to translate. Uh, and here we have uh, the story of uh, the new Troy being located not as it was then in the ancient world, but now in the modern world of Shakespeare in London. Uh, there, there, uh, so there's a certain identification and affection with things Trojan, uh, and particularly with the codes of chivalry, of uh, romantic love, of Petrarchan love, as embodied in a figure like Troilus. Uh, there is at the same time in academic life in uh, England at this time a quarrel uh, kind of political intellectual quarrel within the University of Oxford between people who call themselves Greeks and people who call themselves Trojans, where the Greeks were the classicists, the humanists, the people who were, were recovering classical literature. The Trojans were the supporters of medieval scholasticism, of, again, the language of chivalry, of the sort of indigenous language of Europe as opposed to the recovered language and literature of the ancient world. Uh, so that this Greeks and uh, Greeks and Trojans would have been thought of as a, a a a multiple set of dialogues here. There are lots of ways of being a Greek or a Trojan, of embodying the Greek or the Trojan side here. Um, this play today, and by today I mean over the last you know, fifty years even, has been performed precisely where we began as a play that embodies and anticipates and, and uh, uh, instantiates modern ambivalence, modern disillusionment with war, with ideals, with the power of myth, with the idea of belief, with the idea of the possibility of fidelity and love, that this is a very modern play, in lots of quotation marks, in its interest in and attention to the impossibility of living up to these ideals. And one of the most, uh, one, of the, one of the most fascinating things to me about this play is the kind of parlor trick by which Cressida and Troilus and Pander too all know their own stories even though they are, you know, they're depicted as living in the time of the Trojan War, they somehow have intuited the fact that Troilus is going to be the icon of, of faithfulness against all odds, as true as Troilus, that Cressida is going to be the icon of infidelity, as false as Cressid, and that Pander, Pandarus, is going to become the archetype of all bawds of all pimps of all all that, that the word pander itself is going to lose its capital p and become the the personification of this kind of of cynical bringing together of people for sexuality rather than for love that that these characters all carry around with them and give voice to their own myths even though they are somehow unaware of it so that some of the again the most poignant moments in this play 
is where she is saying, oh, please, I'm always going to be true to you. If not, just always say as false as Christ. And you think, oh, no, there it goes. Because you know more, because you know the myth. You know more than they know about themselves. And that, you know, because Shakespeare is so famous and we're familiar with his plays, we often have that experience with lots of his plays. We know more about King Lear and what's going to happen to him. But there isn't that sense that he's become a myth in quite this way. These characters walk around talking about their own myths, and they were powerless to escape the myths that have created them. Uh, and, and by the time of Shakespeare, these myths have come down through medieval literature. If you read Chaucer is Trollus and Crusade, you'll find that Crusade is a, 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 a much more, I'm going to say, a, 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 she, she's in some ways a more attractive, a more flirtatious, and also a slightly more empowered figure than this Crusader, who seems to be trapped by a series of circumstances that she cannot really escape. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about, about, about the various women in the play and how this functions for them. But this reputation of Criseida and therefore of Troilus as being the icons of doomed love, the icons of, of uh, uh, Petrarchan love gone wrong here, and uh, Cressida as, as, as ultimately embodying falsehood rather than truth. This, by the time of Shakespeare, had reached a point where these characters uh, are, are are describing their own situations as if they've read all these poems, as if they know their own, as if they know their own history, and that ironic situation really increases together with what we know about the Trojan War. I mean, if, uh, if somebody were to rush into the middle of this this play and say, uh, "Oh, the big horse is coming in," you know, I mean, it's, you you know the story already, and they knew this story better than we do, and so it's all about foreboding and doom. So here, I want to put the play in a different set of, I put, put it a little bit in its historical context and a little bit in its literary historical context. Now I want to put it for you in at least two kinds of Shakespearean context. One is the plays that surround it, not only Hamlet, but also Measure for Measure, Twelfth Night, uh, As You Like It. These romantic plays, those of you who know these, the, 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 the plays of, of Shakespeare's high comic period, are again a little bit about disillusionment, about the impossibility of love, as well as its 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 uh, uh, unbearable attractions, uh, about the way in which lovers are trapped in their own situations, and all of these uh, plays really end with something going wrong. With with in the case of Twelfth Night, Malvolio stalking out and saying, "I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you." Uh, but the, 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 so that, that in the plays that Shakespeare's writing around this time, many of these same concerns are being voiced. There are certainly moments in this play in which I hear the voice of Rosalind, in which I hear the voice of Feste in Twelfth Night. And I can cite some of those for you. But, but I particularly want to, to put the play in a different kind of Shakespearean context. And that is, and I do talk about this in my chapter, the context of Shakespeare's three great plays about pairs of lovers, Romeo and Juliet, Troilus and Cressida, Antony and Cleopatra, that these plays are in many ways rewrites of one another, that they engage some of the same issues about how it is that love can make its own little world while around it circumstances are making that love impossible about what it means to have a private moment together, about how a woman can risk by showing her own love. Many passages in this play, wonderful passages, in which Troilus, uh, sorry, Cressida says, why have, I we why have I blabbed? Why have I said what I feel? Now I've given the power over to you. Or he says, why were you so hard to win? Hard to seem one because my power is in withholding my love, just as with Queen Elizabeth. Her power was in withholding whatever she might have felt. Uh, that over and over again, she talks about her uh, incapacity to, to take control of the situation. Uh, and this is very much Juliet's situation in, in Romeo and Juliet, where she comes out on the balcony, doesn't know that he's out there, and says, you know, uh, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? I, I, you know, expresses her love, and then he actually pops up and speaks, and she is disconcerted for a moment and says, "Fain would I dwell on form, fain, fain, uh, 
uh, we repent what I've spoke, but farewell compliment, dost thou love me? Do you love me? And uh, Cressida also finds it even more difficult to ask him whether he loves her because her circumstances are not only the circumstances of the family, but also the circumstances of the whole culture and the whole myth. Not only, I mean, in both cases, you have feuding sides, Montagues and Capulets, or here, Greeks and Romans. But here we have the whole weight of myth of a 10 years war, uh, of uh, where Cressida is merely a pawn here. She too has a father, uh, but the father is in fact the agent of her downfall here. Uh, that the world has become much bigger, and as a result, the lovers have even less in the way of agency. By the time we come, as we will, to Antony and Cleopatra, you'll see that these lovers are bigger still, that it's not only ancient Troy and ancient Greece, but it's really the whole world. And we looked at a passage last time of how the dead Antony seemed to Cleopatra to be a kind of constellation. Uh, that, but, but where, paradoxically, uh, by, by ruling the whole world, by being a an Egyptian queen and the great hero of the Roman army and so forth, they have a way of conquering these myths, of changing the myths, and it's still a tragic story, but they're more in control. They're not necessarily in control of what happens to, to them, but of how it happens to them. Uh, so that these three plays, uh, spaced in time, all of which are love tragedies, all of which are tragic, all of which end in death, uh, are plays that, that, that are very much about this dyad, about the notion of the word and tying these lovers together. Um, and, and there would be a way of looking at Troilus and Cressida as a very, very tiny footnote to the story of the Trojan War. The fact that, the, that we see the war as the background to this story of the love of this couple is part of what makes this play so powerful. Um, uh, so, so, so e modern productions of this play uh, very often mobilize the stories of other wars and other times. Has anybody seen a production that's in more modern dress than Greek or Trojan dress? Yes. Um, I saw the production in National Theater in 1999, um, which blew my mind. I, I saw it before I read it. Uh -huh. So I, at some point, I'd, I'd love to talk a lot about this performance versus reading thing because it's so interesting to me, the experience you have in seeing the play right. versus or in addition to reading it. Um, but they had all the Trojans were played by black actors and all the Greeks were white actors. And it was very um, minimal uh, scenery. Um, and I think all the, my recollection, the Trojans all had kind of white robes. It was, mm -hmm. it was very kind of intense, very, very intense. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't making a reference to a particular other war going on at the time, but the Bosnia, everything was going on. So it was definitely charged with the war. And since I had never read it before, and I had, I had you know, the usual background in the Iliad, you know, some of reading the Iliad and this kind of thing, I was so amazed by especially Achilles the the unsportsmanlike right, <laughs> to, right. to be to right. be mild about it mm -hmm. um, way he killed Hector which I was incredibly shocked the Achilles was the actor was phenomenal and that was an incredible incredible thing about war I mean it was it was almost like watching the war on the PBS thing now yeah, well, it had that same impact to me about the horrors of what people do to each other in war. Uh, there's there's no relief in this play. Yeah. There is no safe space. There is even those character the characters whom who whom you admire are either powerless or doomed or both. Uh, and the play is often it's been done uh, in American Civil War dress, for example. It's been done as North South Gray Blue. It's certainly been done with reference to Bosnia or to Vietnam. It's been done, and I think I mentioned this last time with costumes from a whole variety of different wars all on the stage so that it seems to be the quintessence of war all times, kind of zeroing in on so there's somebody as a doughboy and somebody in a, with a bayonet and somebody with a cocked hat and, and uh, many different wars all at once. Uh, and the, 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 the play very often is seen as Shakespeare's uh, 
pushing back against the senselessness of war, even at a time when precisely, as Henry V has been mentioned, when the glories of war and its capacity to ennoble, literally to ennoble people, uh, are, are, is also being performed. When there is not this automatic notion, oh no, no war, war is not a good thing. War is a way to make a reputation for yourself. But the, the, the play has, has frequently been performed uh, as, as a kind of titration of, of the, the issues having to do with war. And so the, the CNN or PBS is a very appropriate. Now we have a lot of widescreen movies being produced this very year that are about the same set, set of issues. But the question of sort of what, uh, is this really, are these the heroes? Is it really Achilles? Is this, you know, what, when you get up close and personal with Achilles, is this what you encounter? That uh, use of the play. Uh, as, as, as something that seems extremely prescient to a shifting modern perception about the no-win aspects of war, uh, has made this a, a production favorite. I'm particularly interested that you mention production, since if you've read any of the prefatory material to this play, you'll see that the question of whether it was performed and for whom and by whom is very much contested, that there seem to be two title pages of the quarto versions, one of which says, as it was acted by the king's men, and the other one of which says, never acted, never staled with the applause of the, of the common people, and so forth. And there, there are, uh, scholars have reasons why they think one or another of these things might be claimed. But the issue of whether performance in this case came prior to production or, or a publication or publication before performance is actually very, very germane. Uh, this is a, a, also a play that is quite full of wonderful set pieces, pieces that you will recognize as you know, great poetry or as famous Shakespearean passages. And again, to see them in the midst of all this action is also rather startling, and we're going to look at some of those in just, just a second. Um, in my uh, newspaper this morning, I, I, I did this week, I looked at the book review, the fir first uh, page of the book review, uh, of the New York Times, which is about the Supreme Court and uh, about, this is about Jeffrey Tubin's book about the Supreme Court, and the, the reviewer says uh, that it, it, it takes the same, same perspective as a tracking shot in film. It, it, it shows you this one and that, then that one and then that one. And it struck me that that's very much certainly how a lot of the staging in this play works, that you, uh, in order to introduce this unusually large cast of characters, we have scenes like the scene in which Pandarus and Cressida are on some kind of, of, of uh, overlook and parading beneath them are these uh, Trojan soldiers. And uh, a little game is being played between Pandarus and Cressida, in which Pandarus, of course, wants her to, uh, to be interested in Troilus. She's actually deeply interested in Troilus, but she doesn't want to say so. And so she says, that, you know, who's that handsome guy? Who's that handsome guy? What sneaking fellow is this? And of course, the sneaking fellow is, oh, that's Troilus. Uh, again, this is, this is the same move that Juliet makes in the beginning of Romeo and Juliet, when she is at the Capulet Ball trying to figure out uh, who that handsome guy is, but she doesn't want her nurse to know. She wants to know who Romeo is. And so she says, who's that, who's that, who's that? Oh, and who's that? And so here we have the opposite. Uh, the Pandarus wants her to look at this one person. And uh, she's, at, in fact, she's very interested in him, but she wants to pretend that she is not what sneaking fellows this. Uh, so that was one thing that struck me. And the other thing was that just in yesterday's paper where there was an article about the uh, new MacArthur Fellows uh, the so-called genius grants that the, the Jonathan and uh, John and, and Catherine MacArthur Foundation give, uh, and as a literary scholar, I'm always interested to see who are the literary scholars who are so honored. Well, in this list, there are many scientists, and there's a museum director, and there's a vocalist, and there's a painter, and there's a creative writer. Uh, there are no literary critics or theorists, as once there were. Uh, and the one person who engages, you probably saw this, with literature is in fact a psychiatrist who, ha who wrote two books, one about the Iliad and one about the Odyssey, in terms of combat fatigue, combat trauma. And one of them is called uh, Achilles and the, uh, Achilles and Vietnam, Achilles and Vietnam, and the other one is called uh, Odysseus and America. And they're, they're both about returning soldiers and the trauma of war. And it's quite an interesting story, actually, about this guy, that he, himself, he had a stroke at age 40, and he uh, had to, to step aside from his active life as a biochemist and decided to catch up on his reading. And so he read the classics. And then he started using them in his, his practice and writing these books about them. 
I am actually going to get hold of the books and see whether he's read any criticism about these, the, the, uh, or, or whether he's entirely self-taught. But in any case, what he's doing is using these, these uh, classical plays as a way of contextualizing and understanding. And his, he, uh, the, I can't say his assumption. The assumption of the Boston Globe as regards this man's scholarship is that uh, he is, uh, th that as he says, and he, here he's quoted, I saw Achilles everywhere in what these men were telling me, that, that, that nothing had changed in 2,500 years, that it was still the same business of battle fatigue and combat fatigue and stress. Yes? He was a victim of post-traumatic stress, in fact. Who is? Uh, Achilles. Achilles. Yes. Well, that, that's, that's, that's the claim of this man. Uh, and or the claim is that modern soldiers have a nobility and a tradition behind them. And again, I will read these books, so I'm not just making this up. Uh, but, but, uh, but indeed, post-traumatic stress syndrome is a modern name for what in Virginia Woolf's time was called shell shock, and before that had a whole, whole series of other names. It, this is a very modern coinage, uh, and if it is in fact describing the kind of burnt outness that we find in these Trojans and Greeks who have been in their tents in this battle for all this time as the play begins, uh, it's, uh, there's nothing wrong with reading backwards. There's nothing wrong with reading anachronistically. Uh, but it's interesting uh, to me that, again, it's, it's, it's his reading of English language translations of Homer, not, indeed, his reading of Troilus and Cressida, which is a far more uh, uh, unhappy version of the same, less heroic version of the same, uh, that brought him to look at how these, these soldiers were talking to him. So this is all a kind of preamble to say, that the play, uh, however, however difficult its language is early on, and partly the language is difficult at the beginning because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, non-noble language. It's, it's, it's Pandarus uh, bickering with Troilus about sort of how to get Cressida into bed, and you have to stand the bolting and the sifting, and it's as if they're making a cake here. There's a lot of language that seems very local and referring to, uh, uh, to ordinary life rather than to something heroic or, or something very beautiful. Uh, so it takes a while to kind of get into the language of the play, but the play actually is, uh, is deeply resonant, I think, and is resonant on questions like uh, the structure of authority, the nature of love, the possibility of fidelity, the value of ideals, and whether those ideals, in fact, should refer to something or exist merely as ideas uh, separate from anything which, which what might embody them. Uh, so the play is quite full of these conversations. I was going to call them dialogues, but in most cases, it's more than two people speaking. Uh, it's very full of conversations that seem to try to take sides on these great questions, and where you have the heroic figures speaking out there on, on, on these questions. The most famous of all of these speeches, probably in some ways, is Ulysses' speech on degree in Act One, Scene Three, uh, that many of you ha have encountered if you've encountered the notion of the Elizabethan world picture. I wonder if we can look at this speech together. It's in Act One, Scene Three, just so that you, we, we, I can talk about it a little bit. This is the scene in which the uh, Greeks are all arrayed, uh, talking about uh, what they should plan now. They've been here for such a long time. What should they do? Should they give up? Should they stay the course? Uh, again, these are very familiar concepts to us, mired as we are in a war that doesn't seem winnable and doesn't seem as if it could possibly come to an honorable close. Is it more honorable to, quote, stay the course or to withdraw? What about the human cost? These issues which we deal with on the front page of the newspaper are, are all over this play. Uh, but we have a group of Greek uh, chieftains, Greek, Greek lords, uh, discussing this, and each one has a different point of view. We hear from Agamemnon, we hear from Nestor, the old Nef Nestor, and then we hear from Ulysses. What is Ulysses' uh, uh, reputation in this period? What is he, what kind of a character is he supposedly? Crafty, good at Right, exactly. He is crafty. He is, so he's, 
he's not only noble, he's also a good, uh, now again, this is Ulysses is Odysseus, it's the same guy. Uh, it's, he's, he's, a, he's, he's clever, he's manipulative, he's eloquent, very eloquent, uh, but he's also a good politician. And so after two men stand up and say, well, you know, uh, this is very difficult, we don't quite know what to do, Nestor says, in the reproof of chance lies the true proof of men. Uh, uh, then you get Ulysses talking about uh, what they should do. Uh, and uh, I, 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 bear with me, I'm going to read quite a bit of it. I'm going to start with Act 1, line, uh, scene 3, around line 56, just for a second, and then we'll skip around a little bit. Um, Okay, so, so first he praises them for their rank. Uh, hear what Ulysses speaks. Beside the applause and approbation that which most mighty for thy place and sway, Agamemnon is the boss, and thou most reverend for thy stretched out life, Nestor is aged, I give to both your speeches. I respect everything you say, which is a, tick off, a good tip off to you that he's not going to agree with them. Uh, which were such as Agamemnon, every hand of Greece should hold up high in brass, and such again as venerable Nestor, hatched in silver, should with a bond of air, strong as the axle tree, knit all Greeks' ears to his experienced tongue. Yet, let it please both, thou great and wise, to hear Ulysses speak. Well, of course, now they all want to hear him speak, and they contrast him to Thersites, the satirist, the scurrilous, the, 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 the figure on stage who is going to speak the unvarnished truth, the, the, the negative truth. All the argument is a, war, is a whore and a cuckold, Thersites will say. The whole story of the Trojan War is just about a whore and a cuckold, it's about a woman who sleeps around and her husband who can't keep her home. That's it. Uh, and at the end of the play, he'll say the same. Lechery, leching, lechery, nothing but lechery. All is wars and lechery. That's the whole story. That is the running title. Against that, you get the whole, you get whole, all of Homer you get, and all of Shakespeare. You get all of the rhetoric uh, that wants that not to be the case. Uh, so, speak, Prince of Ithaca, and be it of less expect that matters needless and importless burden. Look at the negatives here. Uh, the point of what he's saying is, I do not expect you to say something of no value. So, look at all the negatives. Be it of less expect that matter needless, of importless burden, divide thy lips, than we are confident when rank Thersites opes his mastic gummy jaws, we shall hear music, wit, and oracles. Instead of saying, we expect you to say wise things, he says, we don't expect you to say unwise things. So it's all in this, deliberately in the negative. Everything is, they're stuck. They're absolutely stuck here. Uh, Ulysses now begins to speak. Uh, and he, his, his, his speech... Uh, is, has been taken to be a speech about hierarchy and degree and authority here, and has at various times been unproblematically plugged into a notion of how modern people think, or used to think, that Elizabethan people thought about power. So uh, listen to this with, with, with some grains of, of, of uh, salt here. Uh, look how many Grecian tents do stand hollow upon this plain, so many hollow factions. When that the general is not like the hive to whom the foragers shall all repair, what honey is expected? Degree being visited, masked. The unworthiest shows us fairly in the mask. The heavens themselves, the planets, and this center, that is the earth, observe degree, priority, and place. Insist your course, proportion, season, form, office, and custom in all line of order. And therefore is the glory at planet Sol, our sun, in noble eminence and throwled and sphered amidst the other. So sun is the best of the, of, the, of the heavenly bodies. But when the planets, now I'm at line 94, when the planets in evil mixture to disorder wander, what plagues and what portents, what mutiny, what raging of the sea, shaking of earth, commotion in the winds, frights, changes, horrors, divert and crack, rend and deracinate the unity and married calm of states quite from their fixture. So look at how this line falls apart. Divert and crack, rend and deracinate, to tear up from the roots the unity and married calm of states. This is all about a marriage gone wrong also, quite from their fixture. 
Oh, when degree is shaked, which is the ladder to all high designs, the enterprise is sick. So when, when, when order and sequence isn't in place, the enterprise, that which we're involved in, is sick. And now he's going to give some examples of this. How could communities, degrees in schools and brotherhoods in cities, peaceful commerce from dividable shores, so all those things that bring people together, the primogenency and due of birth, the fact that the eldest inherits, prerogative of age, crowns, scepters, laurels, so old people, kings, nobles, poets, but by degree stand in authentic place. Take but degree away, untune that string, and hark what discord follows. Each thing meets in more, mere oppugnancy. There's nothing but, but, but fighting. The bounded waters should lift their bosoms higher than the shores and make a sop of all this solid globe. And a sop here is not only something that's wet, but it's also a piece of, of bread dipped in wine. So it becomes trivialized here. Strength should be lord of imbecility. And the rude son should strike his father dead. Force should be right, or rather right and wrong, between whose endless jar justice resides. The jar is the fighting back and forth here. Should lose their names, and so should justice too. Then everything includes itself in power, power into will, will into appetite, and appetite and universal wolf, so doubly seconded with will and power, must make perforce and universal prey, and last eat up himself. So here's all that language of eating and food, here in the service of kind of a cannibalistic gesture on the part of a society turned upside down, because there is no order, no degree, no law. Uh, and then he'll go on and give some examples. The general is disdained by him one step below, he by the next, and so forth. So, when, when E.M.W. Tilliard came in the 1940s to write his book called The Elizabethan World Picture, he quoted this passage as an example of what the Elizabethans thought about degree. That God, his angels, the queen, the, the, the nobles, that there was a social hierarchy, that one, one, in fact, went up against it at one's cost, and that, in fact, it was impossible to imagine a world in which the center didn't hold, in which there wasn't this sense of hierarchy of which the notion that the, somehow the, the sun rotated around the earth rather than the earth rotating around the sun was a kind of an emblem here. Um, uh, this, this, uh, uh, Tilliard, however, ends his book uh, by a very little, uh, by glancing at what's going on outside his scholar's window that is at England during World War II and says, you know, against this we see the whole world seems to be arrayed. And in fact, this set piece, which was a set piece in Shakespeare's own time, uh, exists here uh, as, a, as an anti-type, because not even Ulysses believes in it. What is Ulysses' political advice to the Greeks when Hector comes with his challenge? What should, he, what should they do? Exactly. The, the, that, 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 that instead of having Achilles, who is the highest ranking, the, the, the figure of degree and power and so forth, uh, on the Greek side, fight Hector as would be right uh, in single fight, this noble uh, chivalric fight, uh, instead they should, whoops, I'm losing myself here, instead they should uh, send a, a Ajax, who is, is, is much mocked in this text, uh, who is a secondary fighter, who is described as an elephant, as ill-shaped, as not very smart. Uh, we should show our foul wares and think perhaps they'll sell before we show our fair wares. Now, again, those of you who know As You Like It will remember this phrase from, from Rosalind's account of uh, why Phoebe the shepherdess shouldn't set her, her cap so high at, at, that everybody will love her. Uh, sell when you can, you are not for all markets. Here, too, the idea, this commercial language about selling Ajax, think perhaps the, the, the foul wares will sell. Yes? I, I just wonder if this doesn't say more about Ulysses as a character than it says about Shakespeare's view of, of the great chain of being. It says nothing about Shakespeare's view, about anything. Okay. Um, no, precisely. But, but the, the, uh, it, uh, this is against any notion that Shakespeare has a view of the great chain of being. Ulysses has a viewer that he believes or doesn't believe about a great chain of being. 
But there's no reason to think that Shakespeare, I mean, Shakespeare is not a character in the play. Uh, there's no reason to think that, uh, I mean, why should we believe that Ulysses means this despite the fact that he goes against it? What, what in the play would make us think that this notion of a chain of being, so to speak, would be something that, that the play endorses or believes in? Well, Ulysses, uh, just to push the point, sure. seems a cynic to me, and, and that he would use something which is an ideal and generally accepted to gain his ends. Uh, that's why I said it seems to say more about him as a character. Well, I think that's right. I think that, 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 that he is utilizing a familiar argument eloquently and vividly and, and imbuing it with this language of appetite and this language of power and this language of animals and a whole set of kinds of language that we're going to see throughout the play. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that the idea subtract Ulysses is what everybody believes. Uh, they they can have heard it a lot. I mean, what would be a modern bromide? Then somebody give me an example of a of a of a modern cliche about life that that we think we all subscribe to. We have any? Goes around, comes around. All right, that's good. That's good. Fine. Um, so so supposing somebody stands up and says, well, you know, uh, you've heard what goes around comes around, but actually I think, you know. It, it stops here. Um, that uh, doesn't necessarily mean that everybody believes the cliche against which he is speaking. I mean, it's, the play is neutral with, re with regard to this. Uh, we can say he behaves against what it is that he preaches. He preaches something and he practices something else. But we, and we can say they're all incredibly impressed by what he has to say. But it, is there anything in, in uh, I mean, does, does, the, does the play, does, does, do the events of the play endorse some notion of, hierarchy and order. Yeah. I, I don't mean to monopolize. I, what I'm thinking, though, is the plays that are coming, like Lear and Macbeth, are all about order being turned upside down and, and how when that happens, there's a force almost in nature that, that changes things back to the right order at well, a cost. Uh, I would say that in all of all the plays before and all the plays after, uh, order is destabilized and people suffer as a result. What I wouldn't agree with is that we ever get back to that notion of an order. I don't think so. King Lear does not get restored to his throne. Uh, the who follows after, depending on what text you follow, is clearly not going to have that kind of unitary power. Um, Julius Caesar is destroyed, and what follows him is chaos of various kinds, first the, the conspirators and then true chaos. But we don't really have a sense at the end of the play that the world of Octavius is going to restore us to that idealized, if it is idealized, figure of Julius Caesar. Yes, So, Mel. Professor Garber, would you also say the same is true for comedies as well, that despite the fact that it is a comedy, that at the end of it we still are a great deal away from where we started, that there's never a restoration of the status quo. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And just as there's never actually really a marriage, we'll see this next week with, 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 uh, with uh, Measure for Measure. But uh, you remind me to mention that this play sits very uneasily among the genres, that it's been called, I mean, that, that one printed text calls it a comedy, that it's placed in the folio between the tragedies and the, and the histories, that, that people have not known how to classify it. It's a love story, so should it be a comedy? Is people die, so should it be a tragedy? It certainly is about a historical event, so should it be a history? But the, 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 this, is, this is already a long lost ideal. And the, what, 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 but what I would say in terms of the evidence that I'm trying to bring forward here, and then I'm gonna call on you, so Mel, you can scamper back there, um, uh, is that the, the way Ulysses describes the notion of degree here is so negative. The negatives outweigh the positives. So what you see is the loss of degree. You only see the existence of that ladder when it's sick. You only see the existence of the sun in the middle, supposedly, when the planets are about to be wandering in disorder and so forth. What is, if we were to go through and sort of count the number of phrases that describe the negative as opposed to describing the positive, uh, you only get this notion of wholeness through this image of brokenness and disorder. And, and that may be how ideals produce themselves. In any case, I, the idea that the, the Elizabethans, as if this were one common group, Americans all believe, whatever it is, but as if the Elizabethans 
had a belief in this. Certainly there were hierarchies, there were ranks, there, were, uh, the, there was the queen, there were the nobles, there were various kinds of nobles, uh, there were commoners who were in different, uh, but, but, but they're not comfortably in these, they're already all, for one thing they're all in the theater, every single one of them's in the theater. The, the commons, the nobles, the royals, they're all in the theater. Uh, they're all impersonated on the stage. The, uh, we're already looking at a world in which this ideal, if it ever existed, is almost unimaginable. And in fact, if, if that's what really what Tilliard's book talks about. It's the phrase, the Elizabethan world picture, and Lovejoy's phrase, the great chain of being, that suggests a more narrow and, and, and idealized view than these scholars, in fact, saw. But, but certainly, certainly I, I, I completely agree with you that this is Ulysses' manipulation. Uh, do we have time for a question, Steve? Yes, please. Um, this is just I, the first half of the tape. We're not yeah. near done yet. Um, I was, uh, what you were saying about um, whether or not the order ever actually existed. Yes. Seems, it seems to me that although there's a lot of talk about the order and it's a very, you know, it's a very martial atmosphere where it seems like order would be paramount, it seems like the illusion of order is based on the illusion of a meritocracy. Um, for example, Achilles is the proud warrior and Ajax is not as good as what, at what he does, but it really is an illusion because uh, even Ulysses, who, who praises this order, uh, doesn't, he doesn't necessarily, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't follow through on that idea of the best at the, t the, best at the top. Right, well the, what, when we see the best, when we get, when we're, gonna, we're gonna look at Achilles and his life and the complications of his life. We're gonna look at some of these figures. Um, we see that the, this notion of hierarchy is, it, the, these characters seem quite different from their archetypes, so to speak. They all of them seem in tension with their archetypes. I want you to think of these characters in terms of sports heroes. For, I mean, the, this would be the, the clearest way of, because we don't have political heroes like this anymore. What we do have is David Ortiz or Manny Ramirez, or, or, and, and what happens when, when the guy who wins the Tour de France is then now proved to be or exposed to be perhaps somebody who, who has used blood doping. What happens when the heroism that we want to believe in, and believe me, I, it's only in, in entertainment and in sports that we now maintain these discourses of heroism. And with, with people in the entertainment world, we're willing to, it doesn't matter how many drunken driving convictions they have, it's, it's a different world. Uh, the sports world seems to be closer to us in terms of did Barry Bonds really, or did he really hit that home run without the, the aid of, of, of anything else? We'll come back to this question in, in, in about five minutes. Okay, let's see if we can come back to where we were. I want to go right back to this scene that we were looking at, uh, the scene of Ulysses talking about degree, and look at what happens in the rest of the scene, and then I want to contrast it. Come in, please. Uh, I want to contrast it with another version of the same scene later on. So, uh, because this will give you some sense of how the play is built, I think. So if we can return, am I, am I, am I not amplified? Okay, like that. I want to bring you back to Act 1, Scene 3, uh, to also show you something about how it is that Shakespeare is working as a playwright. Because having had this grandiose picture from Ulysses, they say, yes, yes, it's right. He, so he, his conclusion is, to end a tale of length, Troy in our weakness lives, not in her strength. The problem is that we ourselves have, have fallen apart. Uh, and now he'll come to some examples. And his chief example is what's happened to Achilles. And we now get from him a description of Achilles and Patroclus. 
and the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, in which he imagines what is taking place in the tent of Achilles and Patroclus. Uh, he, uh, so stick with me here now, at, at still in Act 1, Scene 3, around line 142. Uh, the great Achilles, whom opinion crowns the sinew in the forehead of our hosts, or the best guy, grows dainty of his worth, and in his tent lies mocking our designs. With him, Patroclus, upon a lazy bed, the livelong day breaks scurril jests. So they're lying around in the tent, according to Ulysses, joking. Uh, and what is, uh, what is Patroclus like? Well, he's like an actor. And actually, he's like a bad actor. Uh, he, uh, with ridiculous and awkward action, and your footnote will tell you that awkward means backward, and there's a glance here at, at sexual backwardness as well, which slanderer he imitation calls, imitation that great classic virtue of drama, of course, to imitate an action. He pageants us, he performs us. Sometimes great Agamemnon, thy topless deputation he puts on. Now remember, we're watching a play in which actors have been performing Agamemnon and Nestor and Ulysses. Now Ulysses imagines a scene that we're not at in which Patroclus is acting the parts of Agamemnon and Nestor and Ulysses. What is the difference between these two kinds of actings? Sometime greater Agamemnon, thy topless deputation he puts on. Now topless here doesn't mean without a shirt. It means, as, as in the topless towers of Ilium, uh, the, the matchless without, without, a, without a, uh, anything above it. Uh, and like a strutting player whose conceit lies in his hamstring, who, whose you know, intelligence is in his legs or in his rear end, and doth think it rich to hear the wooden dialogue and sound with his, his stretched footing and the scaffoldage. The scaffoldage, again, is the theater that he's clomping around on. He acts thy greatness in. So uh, we'll, we'll hear the same phrase later on with Cleopatra, fearing that, she, that her, boy, her greatness will be buoyed by a boy actor on the English stage or on the Roman stage. Uh, here we have Ulysses' fears, in fact, before our very eyes. The fear that they are being acted by people who show them to be foolish or caricatures. Uh, when he speaks, tis like a chime amending with terms unsquared. Uh, at this fusty stuff, the large Achilles on his pressed bed lolling from his deep chest laughs out a loud applause, cries, excellent. Tis Agamemnon just. Now play me Nestor, hem, and stroke thy beard as being dressed to some oration. And so now we have this imagination of what it's like to play the part of Nestor. And he goes on and on. Uh, at this sport, Sir Valor dies, cries, Oh, enough, Patroclus, or give me ribs of steel, I shall split all to pleasure of my spleen. And so he imagines what it's like for Patroclus to be performing the parts of the Greek heroes or the Greek kings uh, in front of Achilles. Again, remember that we've just seen this scene played by actors. And now, if you will, go forward with me to act two, scene three, where uh, Achilles invites Thersites into the company of Patroclus and himself, and goes through the same scene again. Act two, scene three, around line 39 or 40. Uh, Achilles, who is there, Patroclus, Thersites, my lord. Remember, Thersites is the, the scurrilous Greek, as, the, the, table, as the, the list of characters tells you. He's the, the, the cynic. Uh, why my cheese, my digestion, the thing that I like for dessert? Why hast thou not served thyself into my table so many meals? And again, all this food here. Again, serve thyself. They're going to eat him up. Come, what's Agamemnon? And here you're going to get, in very short order, Ulysses' speech on degree as delivered by Thersites. Uh, then tell me, Patroclus, uh, uh, come what's Agamemnon, thy commander, Achilles. Then tell me, Patroclus, what's Achilles, thy lord, Thersites. Then tell me, I pray thee, what's thyself, thy knower, Patroclus, I know all about you. Then tell me, Patroclus, what art thou? Thou must tell that knowest. Oh, tell, tell, says Achilles, the audience. I'll decline, said Thersites, the whole question. This is a, a declension like a Latin declension. It's the various 
forms of the verb. Agamemnon commands Achilles. Achilles is my lord. I am Patroclus' knower, and Patroclus is a fool. Why am I a fool, says Patroclus? Make that demand to my creator, it suffices me, thou art. And again, we get from, from Thersites, Agamemnon is a fool to offer to command Achilles. Achilles is a fool to be commanded of Agamemnon. Thersites is a fool to serve such a fool. And Patroclus is a fool positive. So this is the latter. This is the same sequence. This is the speech on degree from the underside. This is what happens when you use the same rhetoric, but in fact, you're not using ideals, but you're using either satire or uh, cultural criticism or some kind of critique. If you're, not, if, if, if you're not imbued with the ideology that war is a good thing and that fighting for principle counts, and Thersites in everything he says does not believe this, then this is what that speech on degree that took 100 lines winds up being. This one's a fool, and this one's a fool to serve. This one, a f uh, this one is a fool, and this one is just a plain old fool. The bottom is just you're a fool. Uh, so the play functions by doing this kind of thing, by showing you a scene and then turning it inside out in exactly this kind of way. And it does the same thing with the relationship between Cressida and Helen as romantic objects, and then with the relationship between Troilus and Cressida and Diomedes and Cressida that the, 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 the sets of scenes play themselves out and you see their underside. You see how the ideal fails to hold. So uh, here I want to talk just for a second about, about women and value in the play. I'm going to leave some time for questions from you, I promise. But I want to say something about women and value that in a way, that in, the, in the great, great speech uh, in Act Two, Scene Two, in which Troilus, uh, Troilus and Hector debate the question of whether they should uh, keep Helen or let her go. Uh, this is incidentally, your footnotes will tell you, a classic debating topic in the schools. This is not, Shakespeare didn't invent the idea that, that two Trojan heroes would, would think about this. Just as to be or not to be, that is the question, was a famous debating topic. Uh, would, is it better to be and to suffer or to not have suffering by not having consciousness uh, that debaters would, and rhetoricians and, and, and budding lawyers would practice? So they would also practice this great topos from the classics. Uh, should the Greeks keep Helen or they, should they let her go? Uh, or should the Trojans keep Helen uh, and, or let her go? Uh, this, this, this debate is a very classic debate. It's here being given persons who, who perform it. And in Act Two, Scene Two, you get what's ought but as tis valued on the part of uh, whom? Whose view is that? What's ought, ought but what, what is anything but, yes, do you know? What's ought but as tis valued, but value lies not in particular will. Who, who's, whose view is, is, is Hector's and which, whose view is Troilus's? by what you know of them. Which one? Which, which one? The, one of these is one of them, and one of them is the other one. What's ought, but at, what is something, but, but, but how it's valued? And the other one says, but value lies not, but in particular will. Can't just say, it's, it can only be valued by the marketplace. It can only, it can only, you, it can only be valued by something intrinsic. Because this is a question of extrinsic versus intrinsic value. Is it eBay? Is it you know Helen on eBay uh, that she gets a lot of, of bids, whereas Cressida gets no bids, and so Helen is valuable and Cressida is not valuable? Or is it in fact that there is some valuer, some some insurance underwriter, some somebody who's going to come in and say? Uh, this is intrinsically valuable. And, and of course, what would make it intrinsically valuable would not be something material, but something ideal, something from the world of, of, of ideas. Whose view is whose? Yes. Anybody? Uh, well, Trollius is, is the one who believes that she's intrinsically valuable because they made her valuable when they took her from the Greeks, <coughs> I think. <laughs> Aha. So it's a theme of honor and renown. It's, it, it's, 
it, it's been moved to this level of, of the non-material, of the ideal, because in fact it doesn't matter so much about her. And she, you know, Helen appears a lot as a kind of clinging, attractive woman, but she, you don't get that sense that she is anything other but a prize in a way. She's, she, this is the quintessential trophy wife. There is no more trophy wife than Helen. She's exactly that. She's a trophy and she's a wife. Uh, and uh, that's the, the, she is a sign of achievement. Uh, but having been taken, she has then become the objective for a set of ideals that transcend her person, her materiality, herself. She's become a theme, a theme of honor and renown. Um, uh, so this is, this is a basic debate, about not only about economics and value, but about whether, in fact, ideas have values or whether values have values. When we talk about values in American culture, when, when, when somebody like, like uh, Bennett writes a book about values, he's assuming that, they, that, that, that these are not merely marketable things, but these are things that function in the realm of ideals or morals. And this is a little dialogue that deals with the question of how you get to be in that place, of how something gets to be believed that way. Yes? Can we just clarify what the situation with Helen was, like how she came to be where she is in the play? Like if she, she willingly left or she was imprisoned or how she came into this relationship with Paris? How what much does do the play tell us? That's why, I, that's what I'm getting confused about. I don't really remember. I don't think the play does tell us very much about this. We, we know that he calls her Meinel. That, that there's that she's become very anglicized here uh, that uh, there but but there's there's not does anybody have any sense that she is unwilling that she I mean d does she speak about this in, all we have is the play and the play suggests that Paris and Helen are all over each other uh, a good deal of the time and that, they, they, uh, the, that many of the other characters have very little respect for, they think of this as a kind of adventure that he went on, or a kind of whim, or a kind of appetite. Something that got them into this long, long war. But having, having taken this trifle, he has made it into a theme of honor, and they're all dying for this thing. And yes? But he's not fighting. No, exactly. Except, well, nobody's fighting. Nobody's fighting. This is so, so interesting. The word that jumps out at me in speech after speech after speech is the word unarm. Everybody unarms. The prologue comes out at the beginning, and I should read you the prologue because it's in very fancy language. And then he says, hither I might come a prologued armed. And this is in part a citation from a play of Ben Johnson's that does the same thing. But and in like conditions to our argument. So I'm dressed like a soldier because this is a play about war. Uh, and the very first thing that we hear Troy, look at this, at the very beginning of the play. Uh, so we have the prologue. Um, in Troy there lies the scene and so forth. Um, Hither am I come, a prologue armed, but not in confidence of author's pen or actor's voice, but suited in like conditions as our argument. So I, here I am, I don't have a pen, I, I'm, I'm not armed as an actor, I'm armed as a soldier, to tell you, fair beholders, that our play leaps over the vaunts and firstlings that it will start in medias race, just the way, Mil uh, Milton's, the way, way uh, Homer's poem starts in medias race. Uh, beginning in the middle, starting thence away to what may be digested, that is shortened, but also digested in a play. Uh, like or find, find fault, do as your pleasures are. There's a rhyming couplet that ends this thing. Now good or bad, his butt, the chance of war. Enter Pandarus, enter Pandarus and Troilus. Troilus, call here my varlet, I'll un unarm again. And, and so we have prologue is armed, hero is unarmed. And every single person, uh, I, uh, uh, Paris and Troilus talk about, about Helen having the right to unarm great Hector, to unbuckle his buckles after the war, that Helen is going to do that thing that none of the soldiers can do. She can unarm great Hector. And they've all been unarmed in the way that, you know those, those Renaissance paintings that show Venus and Mars, where Mars is, has been making love to Venus, and so what the, his, his, his armor all lies kind of scattered around because he is naked, having been making, making love with her. And the, the various putti, the little, little cupids, are playing with the armor or whatever. So the, the, the god of war is not dressed for war. He has been seduced into love away from his own job. And in fact, his armor has become a plaything for, for 
uh, little figures of love, little cupids, little invisible, perhaps, figures that, that, that animate per people's minds. So here, too, all of these figures are, are unarming rather than arming, over and over again. Uh, when, when Achilles comes upon Hector toward the end of the play, a Hector is exhausted, and he says, uh, I am unarmed, forego thy vantage, Greek. And what does Achilles do? He doesn't say, yes, you're quite right. I'll see you tomorrow on the battlefield. He says, Myrmidons, let's go. This is our chance. Uh, so the, they're all taking off their armor all the time. Nobody's armed. They're all uh, unarmed. The only one that's armed is the prologue. And he's armed nominally in costume, but also with this story that he has to tell. So, so this, is, this is the heroic story of taking off your armor, by and large. And somewhere in the background is this story about how taking off your armor uh, in order to go toward love. I mean, our love and war, because I mean, this, is, this is the war based upon love. And is that really possible? But it, what is Helen valued at? What's Helen's value in this play? If Helen is a stock, are you buying or selling? Um, well, isn't, isn't that kind of, first of all, isn't that kind of the debate? And second of all, um, if, it, as to whether you're buying or selling, um, I would say at this point you're probably selling because, um, she's, she's losing value by virtue of having been the cause of this war. But, but when, what does Hector decide? If Hector's view is, uh, as you suggest, that she doesn't have intrinsic value, that, she, that, that value lies not in particular will, something's really, that, that what's ought but as tis valued. Um, if, if Hector's view is that, that she is not worth what, what, what she, the, the cost, the keeping, and yet he decides, and he, he's instigated this whole conversation and then he comes to the end and he does exactly what Ulysses did. He argues one side and he acts on the other side. He says, nonetheless, I think we have to keep her because we're in this thing so far. We have to keep our troops there. We have to keep fighting on her behalf. Uh, so the, Helen's value is, is a given here. Whatever we actually think her value might be, her value is a given because it is the fulcrum that creates the war. So all these figures are dying on behalf of the rape of Helen, and I mean, the, yes. Doesn't he, spe Hector, specifically say that her value is not as great as the value of the lives who are lost, or the people who are dear who he are does. dying in the war? He does. So he makes it very solid. He does, but then he takes it all back. Then, then he, he's let's let's just look at this. It's two two. Um, It's, I'm not going to read you the whole speech, the, the whole passage, though it's beautiful. Uh, about line 52, Hector. Brother, she is not worth what she'd have cost the, cost the holding. Troilus. What's ought, but as tis valued, Hector, but value dwells not in particular will. It holds his estimate and dignity as well wherein tis precious of itself as in the prizer. Tis mad idolatry to make the service greater than the god. And the will dotes that is inclinable to what infectiously itself affects without some image of the affected merit. Now, dotes is always in Shakespeare a sign of, of passion outrunning reason, of a kind of love that is not really love here. It is mad idolatry to make the service greater than the god, to pay more attention to your ritual than to what it is that the ritual is in service of. Uh, it, so that, 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 that here, contrary to the argument that we've been making, it's Hector, it's Hector who has the idea that there's got to be some kind of intrinsic value. Uh, and uh, Troilus argues against this. They argue back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, here he says, you know, uh, if you'll have vouched was wisdom Paris went, as you must needs, for you all cried, go, go. If you'll confess he brought home noble prize, as you must needs, for you all clapped your hands and cried, inestimable. Why do you now the issue of your proper wisdom's rate and do a deed that never fortune did, beggar the estimation which you prized, richer than sea or land, or theft most base, that we have stolen what we do fear to keep? 
Uh, several pages later, we get Hector saying, yet, you know, about line 190, yet nevertheless, my brightly spreadlin, I propend to you in resolution to keep Helen still, for it is a cause that hath no mean dependence upon our joint and several dignities, that our honor is now based upon this, Troilus, why there you touched the life of our design. She is the theme of honor and renown. Uh, it's about glory again. So this, this Troilus is very much like Hotspur, say, in Henry IV, part, part one. Uh, he is a figure who believes more in honor than in life itself. Uh, and, and, and Hector, despite the fact that he has all these good reasons, we're saying that we should let her go, nonetheless feels that they have now got to the point where her, her, her value, whatever it was, is now uh, the cause that, that upon their, their, their dignities uh, depends upon keeping her here, upon, upon the, but because if they give up the pretext of the war, then indeed they have nothing left. Uh, the, this, and, and, and there's this whole lot of conversation about how the future is going to imagine them, uh, which again, you know, looked at from the point of view of what looks like a kind of time tunnel back to ancient Greece, when in fact it's the future that is now looking at them, is particularly ironic because the question of how these things are valued, it looks quite different. And, and Helen is never an idealized figure here. They can't even remember a time when she was, except in this narrative of, on the part of, of, of Hector, uh, sorry, of Troilus, where he says, you all said she was inestimable. She, so, so is, but this is, this is way, way in the past. But uh, Cressida, in contrast to Helen, what is Cressida worth? One man. Who? And, and Tina, yes, exactly. That, that, that Cressida is exchanged in the ordinary way, unmystified. She's wanted, she's traded for, never mind the relationships, the associations that she, and we may think, we may not, we may think that Cressida's relationship with Troilus is more honorable or more romantic or more like love than what we see of, of Paris's relationship to Helen. Nonetheless, uh, she has no power and she is simply traded away. She's worth nothing, virtually nothing. Who wants her back? Her father, her father Calchas. And why is he over there anyway? And yes, he's a traitor, but what, why, why, ha, why is he a traitor? Just, just out of a whim or? I can't remember what he says. but. Uh... He explains There's a reason himself, why he's yeah. on the other side. Does anybody remember? That who predicted that the Greeks were going to prevail? Well, and, and, and he has also the word of Cassandra, this, this notion that, that, and I should have put her on the board too in my list of, of Greek women or of, of women in this play, uh, that, that the, he, he, he knows about the fall. And so he's over on the other side. Uh, but he's, she's, and, and the play begins with this ironic marking in which Pandarus says, you know, I don't know why she didn't go with her father. And in fact, that, the fact that she didn't go becomes the tragedy that the play looks at here. That the, 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 uh, now, uh, those of you who know Shakespeare's plays will have observed many relationships between fathers and daughters. Uh, name me some of them that will come either before or after this one. Lear and Cordelia, his, you know, the, the faithful daughter and, the, and Goneril and Regan. Who else? Sorry? Well, the, yes, Goneril, Regan, and, and Lear. So give me another example of fathers and daughters. Heracles. Juliet. Juliet and her father. Uh, and her father wants her to marry Paris and she wants to marry Romeo. Somebody else? Pericles. Pericles and, and, his, and his daughter Marina, uh, where, again, if, when we get to that play, we'll see that Marina also, uh, not only does he have a daughter, uh, there's the, this little tension narrative is played out also with Pericles' own marriage, where Pericles' father-in-law pretends that he doesn't want her, uh, him to marry Thaisa. Uh, so the, the, the father's willingness or unwillingness to give the daughter, to give the daughter in marriage, to keep her with him, uh, Polonius, and Polonius and Ophelia. We have examples of, of successful and non-successful sunderings. <coughs> Portia and the dead father, wonderful, where she feels like the dead hand of the father is keeping her from going forward into love and marriage and, and an independent life. And in fact, it maybe turns out that the casket choice is, is enabling that. 
But here's a case in which the father reaches out across the play, across the Trojan War, across from one camp to another, and brings the woman who has been struggling toward a kind of erotic independence and the capacity to choose and to give herself and to be sexual. The father reaches back across and brings her back into his control. Uh, and this is fatal for everybody, it's fateful at least for everybody. That she, because she, is, is, is Cressida, it's a very basic question, is Cressida, uh, despite the fact that the Greeks talk about her as a daughter of the game when they, they, she actually returns to them, what is a daughter of the game? A prostitute. Is she a prostitute? Is, no. How many lovers has she had? One. Who? Troilus. So, so when we meet her, this is a whole new adventure for her. This is really, and, and Pandarus is rubbing his hands and talking about this, you know, the, the, the maidenheads and about, about virginity and about, you know, uh, lovers with their first love and so forth. She so quickly gets turned into this figure of, of apparent uh, multiple partners. When she, when she comes back to the Greeks and they all kiss her, this is another one of these lineups. I've been trying to show you all these various lineups. She kind of goes through down the line and one of them kisses her and then the next one kisses her and Ulysses will not kiss her and so forth. And they, they use her in this way. Uh, and then, then she is given over to Diomedes who is supposed to take her to her father's tent and then she becomes the lover of Diomedes or he becomes her lover. Uh, and the, the, uh, the descent of Cressida from this, her, her unwillingness, her shyness, her, uh, her, her, her fear, perfectly justified as the play demonstrates, that once she gives herself, uh, both in spoken words, why have I blabbed, and also sexually, uh, hard to seem one, my lord. Once she gives herself, once she removes herself from that Platonic, that, that, that Petrarchan position of resistance, she will have given over whatever power she has. Uh, that that's exactly what happens to her. And so the irony here is in part in the contrast between uh, Helen, and here your question about sort of did Helen go willingly or is she a prisoner, is quite relevant, I think, because if, if, if Helen were in a similar position, if we saw Helen also saying, I don't want to be with Paris, I really want to be with Menelaus, uh, then, then you'd have a very different picture of this. But, it, but both Paris and Helen, as you say, he's not fighting, she's not fighting. They're uh, you know, in camp over here, and everybody else is dying around them. So uh, can, can we look at the passage that you provided for us here? Um, because this, this, this passage, I think, is... I've, I've asked Mel and Larry to produce a couple of passages for us, as we, we did last week, I think, so, so nicely with the, uh, the bit of Antony and Cleopatra. It would be useful for us to look collectively at a passage uh, every, every time if we can. And I'd like at least to look at the first one of these. Um, Okay, so Troilus. Why was my Cressid then so hard to win? Cressida. Hard to seem one. But I was one, my lord, with the first glance that ever... Pardon me, if I confess much, you will play the tyrant. I love you now, but till now not so much, but I might master it. In faith I lie. My thoughts were like unbridled children grown too headstrong for their mother. See, we fools, why have I blabbed? Who shall be true to us when we are so unsecret to ourselves? But though I loved you well, I would you not. In yet good faith I wished myself a man, or that we women had men's privilege of speaking first. Sweet, bid me hold my tongue, for in this rapture I shall surely speak the thing I shall repent. See, see, your silence, cunning in dumbness, in my weakness draws my soul of counsel from me. Stop my mouth. Troilus, 
and shall, albeit sweet music, issues thence. What do you notice in this passage in terms of its language? Language, yeah, or, or imagery, or it, <coughs> what, what, other than the sense itself, but what makes the sense or the senses? It seems like it's, uh, like you can almost see it being performed, like he has to be there responding as she's speaking. There seem to be points where he makes a certain movement and she reacts to that throughout the passage. That, that's, that's when she, when she interrupts herself, um, when she uh, uh, points at him, this, this dyxis, this pointing at, see, see your silence and so forth. There's a sense in which, uh, uh, but could you imagine that in fact, she's the motivator of these gestures on his part rather than his actually intervening? Is she, it, when, when, she, when she pauses, when she interrupts herself, uh, is it because he's, uh, <coughs> respond, he's smiling, he's putting his arms around her, he's doing whatever he's doing, or is it, is it something internal to her that is creating this, this, this check upon her? It's something internal to her. She's, it's I'm something it internal to her. She's feeling insecure of his, of, uh, his love, and that's why she's reacting like that. It's, I think we, 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 it, it could be either of these things. It could be internal to her. I mean, one, let us say one could perform it in either way. But certainly what she's giving voice to here is, is the, the question of whether she's lost as well as won something, the question of whether in giving herself she now has lost control of the situation. I think it's about inequality, that um, she's, yeah. she's powerless against his great power. Uh, why does he have great power? Because he's the man. Because he's a man, anyway. Whether he's the man, that's another question. He turns out not to be, the, unfortunately, he turns out not to be the man. Um, he, uh, he, but but this, this question when she says, uh, yet good faith, I wished myself a man, or that we women had men's privilege of speaking first. Now again, can you think of anywhere in the plays of Shakespeare that either or both of these things come true? The Jesus almost says something very Exactly, she does, she does. In, in, in Much Do About Nothing, Beatrice says, you know, oh, that I were a man, I would eat his heart in the marketplace. Uh, but because she can't, she needs Benedict to go be her hero. And, and her instruction to Benedict is very clear. Kill Claudio, go be the hero, be the man. I can't be. Who else? Uh, uh, that we women had men's privilege of speaking first. I gave you the example of Juliet a few minutes ago on the balcony, uh, speaking her love before she knows that Romeo loves her. Who else? Lady Macbeth. Oh, yeah, yes, Lady Macbeth, exactly. You know, bring forth men children only, he says to her. And so she's clearly the, the, the you know, performing those stereotypically male things that the two of them both think are male to a certain extent. Uh, sorry? Volumnia, ah, well, Volumnia is a very Volumnia and Coriolanus will encounter her is a very powerful, but but it's hard to imagine Volumnia speaking her romantic love to the father of Coriolanus. The mind boggles at the idea of Volumnia wooing, but maybe I mean, maybe so, maybe so. Um, but but the, think about Rosalind, for example, uh, who has to dress in men's clothes in order to get Orlando to speak his love to her in As You Like It. This, this scenario, in other words, works out pretty well in Shakespearean comedy. When, I mean, whether it's Beatrice, because Beatrice, you know, she doesn't kill Claudio and Benedict doesn't kill Claudio, but, but her, her voicing this desire to be a man, even though she's dressed in women's clothes, has a certain effect upon Benedict. Both Rosalind and Viola in As You Like It and Twelfth Night, respectively, do, or Portia in Merchant of Venice, do dress as women in order to play the men's part here. But Cressida, this is not a capacity for Cressida. She cannot do this because of the drama that she's in and because of the way gender is in a way constructed in this Trojan world. Uh, then, but on the other hand, we have Patroclus. So I, what do you have to say about Patroclus in this regard? Well, Patroclus isn't exactly seamlessly, sort of smoothly crossing gender boundaries. He's, um, he's ridiculed and he's seen as being less than a man, but obviously he's not a woman. And so he's kind of 
almost the the tone that I think is there is he's almost kind of good for nothing. Well, but, but he also turns out to be a great hero, doesn't he? I mean, there's there's also some discourse about how. I mean, it doesn't the fact that he is or is not, depending upon whether you believe Thersites or not, Ulysses, uh, Achilles' male harlot, doesn't affect his martial prowess. Uh, and in fact, what is it that finally makes Achilles go bonkers and go out to hunt down Hector? The death of Patroclus. Uh, it's th this is what, I mean, Achilles will not leave his tent. Now, what is his claim about why he won't leave his tent? He made a promise, didn't he? To whom and about what? His girlfriend. He's, girl, he's got a fiance. He's got a, got a fiance. Who is she? Yes, she's, she's Polixena, the one of the daughters, one of the infinite numbers of daughters of Dorn. He's got 50 children. So, so, so yes, he, I mean, at least this is, this is the story, is that in, in various other versions, I think it's Briseia that he's in, engaged to, but, but here her name is Polixena. Uh, and we can think about the Winter's Tale and Polixenes when we get there. But uh, the, it turns out, there's, it takes a while to learn this, that it's not, or not only because he's a lazy lout who doesn't want to fight for the Greek ideals, but because he's taken a vow. That's it. He's another vow having to do with love. This is a vow that keeps you from fighting rather than a vow that makes you fight. Uh, but what ultimately brings him out of that is the death of Patroclus and uh, his, the, his immediate desire to revenge Patroclus. Uh, now, uh, what, what would you say is the value of Patroclus in terms of what we've been saying about Cressida and Helen and value here? Yes? Well, when, when the, that whole discussion about what makes something worth something, right. this is what he's worth to Achilles. Yeah. He's not worth this to anybody else. I mean, in the same way, but to Achilles, he's he's the pearl of great price. I mean, he's the most he's Helen. I mean, he's the most important thing to Achilles. He, he so that's why he's that the value, the, mm -hmm. the 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 motive force. And yet, uh, but is it is there a difference beca between between his being a man and, and some of these women being valued? Yes. Yes, there is certain difference because he's a man. He's a friend. That's what differs him from, from anybody, from many of these women. They're not <clears throat> friends. They're maybe objects of sexual desire or some other values for men, but he's also a friend. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe Achilles looks at him also as a, he has a different, um, different, different honor maybe than, than any woman in that world has. Again, let's remember, I agree with you, but, but uh, remember that all these parts are played by men. So that, again, femininity here and the difference between a woman and a man is a performed thing. That Cressida is played by a man, Patroclus is played by a man, Thersites is played by a man. Yes? It seems for me that being a man is a values ab initio. Uh, st right from the start, right. while being a woman is not necessarily a value or might be even something wrong. Like in the case of Cressida or later in the case of Helen. The, yeah, the question of whether women, I mean, this, that's why the value debate is so interesting to me other than that it's very magnificent, is that, that value all seems constructed here. Just as character and gender are constructed, so value is constructed and imbued. Whereas, I mean, you, I think you're quite right to, to assume that there is some initial value in whatever you see of Patroclus. Indeed, whatever you see of Thersites or Pandarus, uh, these are characters who have a different kind of agency, and a different—I mean, and literally an agency in that they can travel back and forth. Cressida is escorted. What then? I mean, what, what do you make of this exchange of tokens, the sleeve and the glove? Because in a way, Cressida is already a token. I mean, the token gives a token. The token takes a token. There's a sense in which this, this, this uh, chivalric exchange in which Troilus is infuriated because Diomedes is wearing his heart on his sleeve. We still have this phrase. Uh, wearing the sleeve that Troilus gave to Cressida as, as an assurance here. 
uh, that this, this is already a theatricalization of something that has been performed for us in terms of character. And the, the, the person-thing exchange here, this question of value, of whether you're a pearl or a person, or whether you're a sleeve or a person or something, is very much this, how value is constructed, is, is performed for us in part by this business of, of, the, of the sleeve. Yes? Is Annie Preston, in a way, making her peace with her lot? In other words, she really doesn't have any control now. So now she's, uh, she's uh, this other guy is going to be her agent uh, for su success, whatever level she can have. Or, whereas Trollius, Trollius is gone, this is the Trollius substitute. Yes, yeah. Um, the, the, I, I hate to keep, I don't hate. I want to come back to Romeo and Juliet again, to the moment in Romeo and Juliet when the nurse says to Juliet, uh, Romeo is banished, so forget about him. Uh, your second husband will be much better. Take the one that's here, not the one that's gone. So, uh, and, and the, the audience does not value this advice, even though we see that it's offered by a, a, a character we used to like. So here, there's a sense in which, as you su suggest, her, her, her horizon of expectation is narrowed. She needs a protector. Think about, about the Lady Anne at the beginning of Richard III, uh, and why she might accept the offer of marriage from this guy who has killed her father-in-law and her husband. And, uh, th there's, there's a sense of protection here, and there's a sense of, of giving up. What is Diomedes' attitude toward, toward Cressida? He seems to want what he wants, and he's not willing to play the game. In fact, that, I think he uses that phrase, uh, whereas Trollius is very willing to play the game. Uh, Diomedes is, uh, I think, uh, much more uh, practical about about what he wants in the situation, which seems to me to be pretty much of the, you know the, the physical mistress relationship as opposed to anything idealized. Yeah. Yes. I think he can. Uh, he, it may be that he also kind of uh, does what um, Troilus doesn't want him to do. There's he may be provoked even by by Troilus telling him, "Oh, don't don't touch her. Just guard her." Blah blah blah, and um, that's what he may be in kind of challenged with in his um, in his pride. How does Troilus find out about the relationship between Diomedes and Cressida? He watches it. Uh, he sees it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Is he alone when he sees it? No. So, so I want you to to bear in mind that this play is constructed on a certain set of kinds of scenes some of which are these plays within the play, of which this is one. There's an onstage audience, Troilus and Ulysses, watching this relationship. We'll see the same scene happen in Othello a couple weeks from now. Watching this relationship, Troilus very much wanting to intervene, Ulysses keeping him from intervening. We have this kind of scene. We have the kind of scene which is what I call in my book an unseen, that is, a scene which is imagined so vividly and described to us that we think we are seeing it, the, the scene that I described to you in which Ulysses imagines what's going on in the tent of Achilles and Patroclus, and Patroclus mocking uh, Agamemnon and Nestor and so forth. Uh, we have the acting out scenes in which we actually see uh, Thersites uh, teasing uh, Patroclus and performing for him in that way. And we also have these, uh, the, the, these sort of, uh, the, the scene that I described at the, at the beginning, this tracking shot scene, that's what I wanted to, to, to say, this, this scene in which uh, uh, Pandarus and Cressida are watching the, Greek her the Trojan heroes go by, or the series of the Greek heroes speak or something in which they're all lined up and they're all speaking their pieces. Uh, and we also have, and this is equally useful, I think, uh, parallelism is on the Greek side and on the Trojan side. Who is the equivalent of Thersites on the side of the, uh, of the Trojans? Yes? Pandarus. Pandarus. Why do you say that? Um, oh. Go ahead. Um, Why is Pandarus e structurally equivalent to Thursday? I guess because they're both offering insight about what's going on, and they're kind of the 
characters who aren't directly involved in everything but are still somewhat on the edges of things? They're observers, absolutely, rather than, I mean, Pandarus doesn't have a romantic relationship himself. He's a voyeur or a pander or something like that. Uh, Thersites too is not fighting. Uh, they, are, they are facilitators, they are manipulators, they are critics, they are cynics, they are bystanders, uh, they are demystifiers. They're, they're the modern. They're the voice of the modern looking at this structure uh, from different points of view. How are they different? How is Pandarus different from Thersites? Pandarus is cynic? have some investment in this. I mean, he, uh, whereas Thersites seems to be totally um, um, outside of it and critical of what's going on. Uh, I think Pandarus is a little upset when uh, this relationship is between Trollius and Cressida is, is broken up. Yeah, the, I mean, uh, to say that Pandarus is a romantic is maybe to overstate the case a little bit, uh, but, but there is an, inv I mean, wh wh what kind of an investment it is, it's hard to know, but there is an investment in, in in bringing the two of them together. Uh, where Thersites, as you say, is, is, uh, really draws a line between himself and these figures. He, he, is, he is the radical of what they're talking about. He's the unvarnished thing. The, what, when we come to King Lear and we see that, that poor Tom on the heath, the, the banished Edgar, is the thing itself, thou art the thing itself, the bare forked animal, Thersites is, in a way, the thing itself. We'll see a figure like this in, in Measure for Measure as well, a kind of uh, demystified truth teller, not highly regarded, who speaks to the audience from the point of view of, of a really deep cynicism about, about human character or human personality. What happens to Pandarus at the end of the play? Yeah. He's going to. He's going to, you know, make a career out of being a pimp. That's what's left to him. He's going to turn into himself. Yes, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Kind of, yes. A self-fulfilling prophecy. The, you remember the bargain in the middle, in which they all say, "He says, here's a bargain made. You know, if you're false, we're all going to say as false as Cressid. If you're true, we're all going to say as true as Troilus. And let, if that happens, let everybody call the, the, the bringers together, the brokers between panders. And it comes not only has come true already in Shakespeare's time. This is, these words are all in the dictionary. Uh, but it comes true even by the end of the play. There's some dispute about where the play ends. There's sort of the, there, there's some suggestion. I mean, in some versions of the play, Pandarus does not come out and say, "I'm Pandarus. I'm I'm now." Uh, let me just show you where the where the 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 split sometimes is. In Act Five, Scene Eleven, um, when. Uh, Again, those of you who are familiar with Shakespeare's tragedies will know whether it's the early tragedies like Romeo or, the, or, or Julius Caesar, or the later tragedies like King Lear or Macbeth, you'll know that very often the tragedies end with uh, a survivor coming forward and saying, let's go talk about this, let's see if we can make sense of the history we've experienced. The implication is that somehow revisiting the events of the play will disclose some things. But it, it's, a, it's a gesture toward leaving the stage and trying to remember. And it's a gesture often spoken by a character lesser than the greatest figures of the play, but someone who's, who also uh, brings an obligation into the audience to continue that conversation. And if you look at Troilus uh, around line mm, 20, uh, uh, a little bit before, uh, about lines 12, maybe, uh, in Act 5, scene 11, uh, where uh, Troilus is talking about the death of Hector and what the death of Hector means. And for him, it means the end of belief, the end of, of, of the possibility of idealism. He's dead and at the murderer's horse's tail and beastly sort dragged through the shameful field. Uh, Hector is gone, about line 14. Who shall tell Priam so, or Hecuba? Let him that will a screech owl I be, who will a screech owl I be called, go into Troy and say there Hector's dead. There is a word, will Priam turn to stone, make wells and Niobes of the maids and wives, cold statues of the youth, everybody's gonna freeze, and in a word, scare Troy out of itself, but march away, Hector is dead, there is no more to say. 
And some versions of the play end there with this rhyme couplet, with this gesture of leaving the stage, and with this idea that you have to tell it, but nobody is going to believe it. And that, in fact, the statement, Hector is, is dead, is uh, like Hamlet's, I am dead, Horatio, one of those impossible things to say. It's the end of a whole structure of belief. Uh, the play, however, in the version that we have, and that most of us have, goes on. Um, and Troilus speaks some lines here that he also speaks slightly earlier in the play. Hence, broker lackey, ignominy and shame, pursue thy life and live I with thy name. So he names Pandarus as a, as a figure. He makes him into an allegorical figure. Poof, you're an allegory. You are, I, I am going to control this story and take of my love story that you have turned inside out so much into a caricature. Uh, live I with thy name, and everybody leaves, and then you have an epilogue from Pandarus. And half of it is in prose, a great Shakespearean medium, and the medium often of a kind of low voice. Why should our endeavor be so desired and the performance so loathed? People who know earlier plays of Shakespeare, who's the kind of character who would speak in a language like that? It's very like Falstaff. It's this, this line is actually very much like Mistress Quicklight, beginning of Henry V, about Falstaff. Uh, what verse for it, for instance, for it, let me see. And then he reads a little bit of verse in here. And then, then he calls us all panders. Good traitors in the flesh, set this in your painted claws. This is not them. This is us. As many as be here of Panders Hall, your eyes half out, weep out at Panders Fall. Or if you cannot weep, Yet give some groans, though not for me, yet for your aching bones. And here, this is the idea here is of venereal disease. Brethren and sistren of the whole door trade, all of us panders. Some two months hence my will shall here be made, and so forth. Till then I'll sweat and seek about for eases, and at that time bequeath you my diseases. So why, why might the play end? with this figure of pander, this invocation of, of, of sexual disease, this idea of, of going forward into a world made of people like this. What's happened in this play? Or how would you compare the two endings? Supposing I were to set you as a, as a, as a problem, so choose one ending and say why. OK, good. So one, one seems, I'm sorry, we're not being magnified. One seems tragic and one seems satiric. With yeah. Hector, it's the death of an ideal. Say again. Hector is the death of the ideal, and, and Pandarus seems to be the triumph of, of decay and, and cynicism. And survival. And the survival. triumph of decay, yeah. cynicism, and survival. That, that, that world, that <laughs> diseases continue. The, this long disease my life, says Pope. The, 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 that there, there is here this balance between, that's why I love that when, it, when there's a double ending like this, because you see how it works in one way and how it works in the other way. That we have Troilus himself having lost all, fa feeling now that he must speak uh, the, the, the radical. Hector is dead. For him, that's the most basic possible thing to say. For Pandarus, that itself is a story. That's yesterday. And it's as if he's come out onto the stage away from this battle of 2,500 years ago and into the modern world. And we'll see that these plays, the same thing happens in Hamlet, the same happen thing happens in many, many of these plays, that even the loss of an ideal is an ideal because it instantiates something, just as this question about whether Helen is worth something, instantiates Helen's worth even as we debate about it. So also for Troilus to feel disillusioned is to uh, instantiate his illusion or to canonize his illusion. Uh, for a Pandarus, a Thersites, to say all the argument is a whore and a cuckold, that's all you need to know about the war, uh, is a very different kind of narrative. And these plays are poised in that dialectic. And we will see, certainly next week, where we're going to wind up in that world of brothels uh, and of ideals. Uh, and as we go on and we look at the highs and the lows, we're going to see this balance always, uh, or I should say imbalance, always at war with itself here. Uh, we've got to stop, unfortunately. There's lots more we could do with this play. On to measure for measure. As you can see, we're going to try to speak cumulatively about the plays. Uh, don't forget this one as we come to talk about the next one. <laughs>